Good evening. Good evening and welcome everyone. My name is Harry West and I am a professor of anthropology and chair of the Food Studies Center here at SOAS. Our event this evening is co-sponsored by the SOAS South Asia Institute and the SOAS Food Studies Center with assistance from our colleagues in the Office of Development and Alumni Relations and in the Centers and Programs Office. The SOAS Food Studies Center was founded in 2007 and its main activities bring together not only SOAS researchers and students, but also colleagues and students from other academic institutions in the UK and beyond, as well as policymakers, activists, journalists, and makers and vendors of food. The center fosters the teaching of food-related courses at SOAS, principal among them an MA in the anthropology of food. And I see some of our students out there this evening. It also convenes a weekly SOAS Food Forum, as well as a series of distinguished lectures, all open to members and associate members of the center. Now, information on the center and the MA program is available on the table just outside this room. Uh, so should any of you be interested in joining the center, uh, which is free of charge, uh, and be placed on our email list, you'll find the email address there, but it's soasfoodstudies at soas.ac.uk. So send us an email and we'll sign you up. Now, before I introduce this evening's speaker, um, and uh, he'll introduce the panel, uh, a few words about the SOAS South Asia Institute from its deputy director, Dr. Navtej Poraval, uh, who is senior lecturer in contemporary Indian uh, studies and sociology. Tej, please. Right, thank you, Harry. Um, good evening to everyone. It's a pleasure to see so many of you here tonight um, for the lecture, which is jointly hosted by the SOAS Food Studies Center and the South Asia Institute. The South Asia Institute was established last year in 2014, but was officially launched earlier this year in 2015, May. The Institute was set up as a window through which the world could access SOAS and its vast regional expertise on the region, but also as a means for SOAS to showcase, highlight, and share its knowledge of the region of South Asia beyond the university, with our academic members engaged in research and teaching on Bangladesh, India, Nepal, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and Bhutan. Within our broader aims to promote research and teaching on South Asia, we are striving to keep the teaching of Bengali alive, which we are proud has a long and rich tradition at SOAS, and we are keen to establish connections with businesses and other links who may be interested in extending their support to a range of our other activities as well. The South Asia Institute strives to make contributions to our understandings of economic, cultural, and social processes affecting the region, as well as the region's engagement with the rest of the world. Tonight's lecture is a perfect example, um, and of course it's not just a lecture, it's a, it's, it's a panel uh, presentation and discussion. Um, um, and in terms of Iqbal, Iqbal Wahab's experience, you know, someone originating from South Asia has made a tremendous mark on London, which in the process of making it his home as part of the South Asian Bangladeshi diaspora, has also made it his base for entrepreneurship, innovation, and social responsibility. So the South Asian Institute is pleased to be a part of the hosting of this event tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our main speaker and chair of this evening's panel. Iqbal Wahab was born in East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, in 1963. In 1964, his family moved to London, where he grew up and attended school. He went on to study business administration at the London School of Economics, where he received his BSc. After university, he worked as a journalist in the national press before setting up a PR agency specializing in hospitality in 1991. Three years later, he launched Tandoori Magazine, a publication focused on the South Asian food industry. He subsequently sold the magazine and in 2001 opened The Cinnamon Club, 
an award-winning restaurant and bar that changed perceptions of Indian cuisine in the United Kingdom. In 2003, he co-authored The Cinnamon Club Cookbook with Chef Vivek Singh. Then, in 2005, he opened Roast, a restaurant and bar in the old Floral Hall in Bur London's Borough Market that specializes in British cuisine made from the finest seasonal ingredients. In addition to his, his successes in the catering industry, Mr. Wahab has made valuable contributions through public service. From 2006 to 2013, he chaired the Department for Work and Pensions Ethnic Minority Advisory Group, which worked to reduce ethnic minority unemployment levels. He serves on various boards and committees, including as chairman of the Asian Restaurants Skills Board, and of Bounce Back, a charity and social enterprise that focuses on the training and employment of ex-offenders. He is patron of Mums the Chef, a social enterprise that tackles long-term unemployment among ethnic minority women by cultivating cookery skills, and of Leap, a charity helping young people, especially those from disadvantaged communities, to find employment. For his public service and his contributions to the hospitality industry, Mr. Wahab received an OBE in 2009, and in 2010, he was made a fellow of the Royal Society of Arts. He is the recipient of numerous other awards and accolades, from Menu Magazine's Restaurant Personality of the Year to being named one of GQ's 100 Most Connected. He has received honorary doctorates in business administration from the University of East London and in science from the University of West London. He is also a visiting professor of the, of the London Metropolitan University Business School. I could go on, but I'm sure you'd rather hear Iqbal and the guests on his panel, which is entitled Making Social Responsibility the Main Course, Social Change and Good Business in the Restaurant World. So thank you, Iqbal. Thank you, Harry, and thank you all for coming this evening. In many people's eyes, restaurants have a pretty poor image. We rush people in and out to maximize our profits. Uh, we swipe service charge away from employees. We have uh, aggressive bullying chefs and nightmare owners with massive egos. And over the decades, we've pretty much deserved that reputation. But the restaurant world now is a very different place from the one I entered in the 1990s, in which Alan entered around the same time. Um, we're no longer judged um, by critics on how good we are, because thanks to Twi Twitter and TripAdvisor, we're all restaurant critics. And so there's, in that process, there's been a, a democratization of comment, where the people that matter are the people who pay our bills. And that's a rapidly um, changing mode of perspectives. Um, and so what defines what a good restaurant is, um, is someone who uh, actually listens to rather than tells a customer about what they want. In its more free form, pre-democracy days, London restaurants would outdo each other to try and find something new, because that's what public relations uh, companies would tell their clients they needed to do. If it wasn't new, they wouldn't be able to gain coverage for it. And um, as restaurant folk, we, we love the coverage as much as we love the profits, so much so that we think that the former drives the latter. About 15 years ago, a central London restaurant um, created a, a new concept which fused Italian and Japanese cooking. The critics largely hailed it as a triumph, but the public decided enough was enough and didn't go, and it shut down. In New York, still probably the world's leading city for the breadth of its restaurants, people still have a seemingly insatiable appetite to find out something new. Earlier this year in Brooklyn, a restaurant opened where the chef owner dictated that there could be no talking in the restaurant. <laughs> that, uh, unless there was pure silence, people wouldn't be able to appreciate the wonder that was his cooking. The place is packed, night and day. But I, th I think that if it opened in London, the silence would be on the reservations line. Because <laughs> uh, New York may have uh, breadth, but London's got depth. 
And it's that increasing depth of perspective that is driving much of the change in the way in which businesses are increasingly able to tackle social inequalities. And that's the focus of what I want to present to you today. Um, food and drink and restaurants are, are given tools. And along with our distinguished panel of contributors whom you'll meet during the course of this talk, I hope we'll reinforce that message that restaurants are able to deliver much more than food and drink that we are agents for social renewal. And by social renewal, I mean strengthening communities and neighborhoods through enterprise, empowerment, and employment. Food and eating can, change, can forge intimate connections between people and places. Embracing food from local areas delivers both ecological and social justice and provides an opportunity for building communities and does so with consumers and producers in what's being uh, now called a food shed. This, which is a creation of local economic clusters. Let me tell you a bit about how my own voyage of discovery into what I'm um, building up to this evening happened. It was about a decade ago that I first moved into Borough Market to open roast. And that part of South East London, you'd only go on a Friday or a Saturday to go to the market. The rest of the time, it was pretty much a no-go area. But on the Fridays and Saturdays, I noticed that the kind of people who were coming to the market were coming from Kensington and Chelsea, Richmond and Barnes. Because in those days, it cost you about 15 pounds to buy a chicken. Today, it costs more like 20 pounds. And I used to ask the trustees who owned the market, what about the people on the other side of the road? They probably spend about one pound 50 on a chicken. And um, the trustees, in, rather plausibly, depending on how you see it, said um, that was beyond their remit. Their remit was to create an environment to celebrate the best of British produce. And if the people on the other side of the road couldn't afford it, there's not much they can do about it. And, and I, I found that rather odd, but I thought, rather than just accept it and go with the flow, I thought, let's see what Rose could do to bring more people in, to make the market more inclusive of the communities around it. So from the first day we opened, I dedicated one of the tables in the restaurant, and all the profits on that table have gone to support uh, communities and people from uh, backgrounds who haven't had it so easy as our customers and as the owners of, of the restaurant have had. So we started working with the local Prince's Trust and I used to bring in groups of uh, people from South East London and have breakfast with them, take them around the market, give them an experience of what it's like to work in our kitchens or to work in our bar or to um, how to handle reception. So that in due course, when they were coming out of school, they might think of roast as something that wasn't other to them, that might be something that they could um, possibly go and work in. In some of the cases, they'd already um, got involved in a parallel economy of gangs. And often I'd meet kids aged 15 who were carrying guns. Although these days they call them burners. You know that, they're called burners. Um, I wouldn't so surprised that they'd gone into gangs at that age because I too, in a previous age, uh, been brought up in South London, I too uh, had been part of a gang. Um, and in my own time, but we, 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 we didn't carry guns, we were wusses, we had flick knives. Um, and um, um, and we, we got so engrossed in this gang, in our extracurricular activities, as we now call them, um, that we saw, no, we saw no point in studying. And so we all failed our O-levels together. Um, and my parents were so dismayed, they said, why don't you retake them. You didn't really try so hard first time. And, um, so I did. And I went to university and I went on to do the things I, I did. Uh, the others in the gang uh, didn't receive any such nudge. Um, two ended up in prison. One committed suicide. One was killed. Uh, and the rest just led uniformly meaningless lives. So I'd grown up knowing that quite often a small touch can trigger a big impact. I've taken much personal satisfaction over the years in mentoring kids from council estates, um, people who had no father figure and see them go to university, set up in business, go work in a big firm. But those are largely personal gains for me. What about the business? How did this commercially impact on us? Convention was that businesses would reach a certain level of maturity, by which we meant profitability, before undertaking any kind of philanthropic act. We threw that model out at roast. And so whilst we were still in loss-making mode, some of the team around me 
uh, would think that we were prolonging that loss-making mode by starting off from day one by committing part of our resource away from profit and into what my finance director used to call fluffy stuff. My challenge back was to not view this as a cost, but as a social investment, which will one day witness a return back to us. And um, I suppose by social investment, I mean a strategic financial input that positively impacts both on the communities that are of concern to Rose, but also to the financial health of the company itself. Only I couldn't bring myself to say that to my colleagues at the time, unless they thought this too fanciful an idea. Businesses have traditionally siphoned off their consciences to what we call co corporate social responsibility. The problem I view with social uh, CSR activity is that it's seen as a cost and not as an investment. And in a, in a company, uh, they siphon off the conscience of, of the company to one person so that they have the responsibility to look after the concerns of the company while everyone else gets on with driving profit. And for many years, I suppose I was roast CSR officer. It would be me going off to Africa to visit slum dwellings um, and to see how we could bring entrepreneurial skills like mine into slum dwellings. Uh, it would, more locally, it would be me going to Brixton Prison and talking to inmates about the prospects of work and, uh, rather than return to crime. And then one day, the light went on in my mind. I, uh, I was invited to go and take part in a program that Gordon Ramsay was doing where he was teaching inmates in Brixton Prison about how to cook. And um, he invited a few of us in to have lunch one day, cooked by the inmates, and they were right in front of us. And I was particularly impressed with one person whose uh, skills seemed um, pretty impressive. And I said to Gordon, that guy's like, really good. He said, well, six weeks ago, he couldn't even boil an egg. And so I went to this guy afterwards, and I said, if you're interested in work experience when you uh, finish here, just ask a governor um, uh, whether you can, they can put you in touch with Roast. Um, so fast forward a few months, and um, I'm walking into my office, and in our little reception area, I see somebody filling out a form, and I look at him, and I think, I know you. You're the guy from Brixton. What are you doing here? And he said, uh, I'm filling out a form. You've given me a job. And I said to him, I had no idea you'd even applied for a job. And to be honest, I've forgotten I'd even offered the uh, work experience <laughs> in the first place. Um, so I said, it's really important for you to know that you got this on your own merit, that I had nothing to do because I didn't even know you were applying for it. So don't think that you got this job as an act of charity. It's very important for you to know that. And he was so chuffed with this that he went and told Gordon's team, who then put an article in the Evening Standard. And um, then a funny thing happened. I got, I got a whole load of phone calls and letters from people saying pretty much the same thing. Uh, Dear Roast, I've never been to your restaurant, but now that I know you do things like that, I shall start coming. So this was a groundbreaker for me, because now this was a, there was a commercial case for social intervention. And with that, I could then actively encourage other members of the company to participate alongside me, and that the team could, could warrant time off. And it wasn't really time off again, it was investment. And the team became more than our employees, it became our neighbours, our suppliers, our, uh, our investors, our landlords. And with their involvement, we greatly amplified the effects of all our social activities. Um, blimey, it worked. Um, when we decided to do a pop-up roast in a prison earlier this year at a Young Offenders Institute called ISIS next to Belmarsh, our managers and chefs owned the project entirely, training inmates on how to prepare a roast menu. And you'll see some of them up there doing it now. Um, the guests were, uh, on the evening were mainly our uh, customers, our landlords came, our suppliers came, a potential investor came along. Five members of our team volunteered their time, including an ex-employee who took those pictures. Two of the participating uh, prisoners in that programme came to work for us on release. I don't know if you know this, but some two-thirds of uh, released um, prisoners end up back inside within a year. They're given £43 on the day they, uh, they're released, and it costs £40,000 a year to keep somebody uh, locked up. Over the years, 20 ex-offenders have ended up working at Roast. Reoffending rates for those in jobs drops to single-digit percentile rates. As they say in America, do the maths. And it's increasingly important to do the maths and prove the case beyond a philanthropic do, doing good perspective. 
So I hired an economist to do a social impact assessment report on our various activities. We kick-started a social enterprise called Mum's a Chef, which empowers women uh, suffering from the terrible um, benefits gap and um, gave them the one skill they already had inside them, but they never knew it was a skill. They just knew it was a chore, which is cooking. They're based in Croydon. So we put them through Croydon Catering College, got them MVQ levels, um, and we gave them a contract at Roast to feed our team, and we did it for six months to get them going, like a kickstart. There were 12 women got a job on the back of that contract. And um, not only did it have many unmeasurable outcomes, like posit much more positive mental health and increased self-confidence, but it also saved the state £312,000 in benefits for a £30,000 contract. We're not just um, local actors, though, with local responsibilities. We're global citizens, too. About 18 months ago, I went with Terry Waite, the former Hezbollah uh, hostage, to visit um, a, a, a very, very poor country in West Africa called Togo. And we visited a slum dwelling called Katanga. And um, the YMCA there, which is um, run by YCARE International, which is an umbrella body of all the YMCAs around the world, um, has made enterprise a key priority for the um, young people um, of Togo. And so in this horrible um, uh, slum dwelling that we visited, we spent the best part of, I don't know, we spent half a day there. Um, we saw them, these women were like trying desperately hard to um, set up businesses smoking fish. But they were all being scuppered by middlemen and markets um, delaying their payments. And so despite all their efforts to, to go, get on business, they were actually remaining static in their social and economic position. And I thought at the time that if they had some business training and understood financial management and planning, they'd fare a lot better. So I invested in a a group of five women to go to business study school and learn these skills. And here's how they did. We see them up there. Uh, Aichitu, uh, age 24, is an orphan. Before going on her course, she was earning 15,000 of their francs. Now she's earning 25,000, uh, which is an increase of 67%. She can buy her own um, supplies for her business. And she's hired an assistant, a dama, is a widowed mother. So since doing that course, her in, uh, income has increased by 50%. She buys tools for her firewood business and, and has hired someone else to work with her. Gertrude, age 23, is an orphan mother with two children. Her income since going on that course has increased by 133%. She's hired two people to work for her and she can feed her children um, with, um, and give them pocket money so they can have breakfast at school. Agbovi was 15, was an orphan, couldn't write, didn't have a job before going on this course, and now is earning 5,000 francs a month, as is Ahufa, also age 15, and she's employed two more people. I call this an investment into those courses, but actually, we made it a loan. A loan that wasn't repayable to the Rose Foundation, but back to the local YMCA. Those women have all repaid their costs of their tuition, and so, uh, which has happened within six months. Um, and so what we've done is that we've now matched their contribution so that more and more people can go through this course, because now that we've proven it works, we want to escalate it. If I'd gone there as a more conventional philanthropist, I'd have written out a check and just hoped something good would have happened. Having come from a restaurant background, I knew how to navigate through markets and break through barriers that agents put, um, and suppliers put in our way. And I was able to use that um, skill and that experience to help those five women who hopefully will do the same for uh, future women in that area. One of the Harvard Business Review's most celebrated articles of recent years was called Creating Shared Value, in which Michael Porter and Mark Kramer, in describing a new version of inclusive capitalism, made the point that businesses shouldn't have random moments where they act as charities. Only when businesses adopt social values as a core commercial practice do they see the most sustainable and far-reaching impacts. 
Let's take the example of the Cinnamon Club. Indian restaurants have a reputation for have, operating closed door policies, only employing friends and family, not really seeing the wider obligations to communities, not using their spaces for uh, other purposes and serving their customers. Uh, my first guest contributor this evening is fittingly my close collaborator in creating the Cinema Club, Vivek Singh. Vivek, please share with us how you helped debunk those stereotypes. Thank you, Iqbal. And a very good evening, everyone. Well, I think the, the year might have been 2005. Um, and I still remember, like yesterday, um, saying to, to Iqbal how a certain young chef that had worked in our kitchens for a little over six months, close to a year, um, seemed to have such a positive impact on our teams. Um, this young chef happened to be Alan Sperring, the first non-Indian, non-Asian, British chef that had just walked through our doors and waited about two hours when I was sort of in the middle of lunch service, uh, waited to, to, to meet and said, well, I just want to come and spend some time in your kitchen. I want to learn how to cook. Um, I never had that experience before. In fact, to the contrary, I thought um, it was going to be hard to recruit people, and I didn't know how it would go. So um, I, I gave him a chance. I said, you know, I'll come in, come work for a few months. And I was saying to Iqbal after he left, I think it was just short of a year, how amazing that experience had been. His, his interest, his energy, the enthusiasm for our spice, our world of flavor, of taste. Um, was an absolute eye-opener for myself. And as I was saying um, all this, I could see Iqbal's um, eyes kind of change. Um, I mean, it, is, it is a small matter that this chef clearly understood what, it, what we were about, the flavors, the excitement, the journey, the, the, the voyage of, uh, through spice. He clearly understood. He learned the essence of it. He went on. Um, to work in Dubai for a little bit, came back to the UK, and now runs one of the country's best Indian restaurants called the Chili Pickle in Brighton. Um, check him out. Check him out when you get. Um, well, <coughs> coming back to what Iqbal's reaction was, it, it, it was something that only Iqbal can have. First things first, he said he wasn't surprised that Alan was so excited by an opportunity to work in an Indian kitchen. And, you know... <clears throat> And, and that was something, what, what Iqbal said then really changed the way I look at teaching or learning, training or sharing. Um, Iqbal said he wasn't surprised that Alan was in some ways more excited about Indian food than some of our existing Indian chefs would ever have been. He said, after all, look at Gordon. He was cooking the best French food in the country then, and he wasn't French. Um, look at Jamie, he was the best Italian chef of the land, and he had never been to Italy, he'd never sort of, you know, he wasn't Italian. Um, and, and for that matter, David Thompson at the time, who had a, a one mission star, Nam, um, in London, was possibly the best known Thai chef anywhere in the world. He wasn't even Thai. So that got me thinking about teaching. It got me thinking about opening up our kitchens to people of all backgrounds. For people, anybody who's wished to cook and learn Indian food, wanted to learn a little bit about spice, anybody who was, who we could teach, train, or share knowledge with, would be that little bit extra that would keep our jobs interesting. Certainly very selfish as a motivation for me at, at the point in time. It was more about making my own life and my own job a little bit more interesting than it was just cooking for 300 people every lunch and every dinner. Um, mind you, this was before. Um, this was much, much before the clamp on immigration, um, the restriction of visas for chefs, or for that matter, the economic crash of 2008 that has been so well documented in the, in the world of restaurants. Our kitchens in 2005, 2006, 2007, were already open to people from all backgrounds, being prepared as a training and teaching ground. We were future ready, so to say, or so we certainly thought. Um, then, of course, 2008 happened, and everybody and everything kind of melted into a, went into a meltdown. Economies crashed, businesses folded, benefits cut, jobs vanished. 
young people who start the opportunity, that first job, that first rung on the ladder, that first real sort of opportunity to go and have a job, no matter what, um, which just wasn't there and there wasn't that much. I thought, you know, opportunity was needed, was required. By this time, our experience of training and teaching people from all different backgrounds has given us the confidence to further our reach to people who may or may not be trained chefs. We thought, you know, after all, you don't need to be a rocket scientist. You don't need to know a lot. All you need is want, want to cook. And to be a good chef, and I've, I've maintained it for a long time, you really don't need a lot. If I could have done it, anybody can do it. Um, all you need is a reasonably good intellect, a very good palate, and an even bigger heart. And if you've got those three things, anybody can cook. Um, so with this, and with a view to attract talent from anywhere, it didn't matter where they came from, where they wanted to go, um, anybody who was interested in cooking, we thought we had an opportunity and a responsibility almost to, to develop the future generation of chefs for Indian restaurants in the UK. And again, I think Iqbal was greatly involved in the Asian Restaurant Skills Board, and we launched Mastara Chef, an initi initiative of the Indian Asian Restaurant Skills Board. We actually launched a YouTube campaign to recruit. If it plays. We want to cook. We want to cook. We want to, to create. create. Queremos crear. We're determined. We're passionate. Living the Ahlam. And we're dedicated. But we are not all the same. We're from different, different backgrounds. We have different ideals. And different dreams. And different dreams. But all of us want to learn. Want to learn. Pero todos nosotros. Morido an natalna. We want to learn the traditional. And the modern. The history. And the theory. The ingredients. The flavors. The colors and the tastes. The tastes. We want to understand. To understand. We want to know how. Because we want to cook. To cook. Porque queremos cocinar. Morido an otrach. We want to cook. That guy with the pan, he's got a terrible temper. <laughs> he's still there. Um, it was nowhere as easy uh, recruiting as we thought. Um, and I often beat myself up thinking, you know, we could have done more, we could have had more, we could have had more success with it. Um, in spite of its modest success, I look around, the number of familiar faces, this was done about four years ago, um, the number of familiar faces, the people who are still in the business, um, the apprentice program has resulted in at least 18 examples of people from various different backgrounds successfully working as chefs in some capacity or the other in the world of food, and more importantly, out of benefits. Opportunities seem to work. All this was great until one day <clears throat> I realized that opportunity didn't just have to be for chefs, for people who wanted to do something in the world of food, or necessarily wanted to start off somewhere. It could happen in any shape, way, or form. And one day in 2012, I met somebody who was, from a, who was very different from the people we had come across so far. This was the powerhouse behind Darjeeling Express, Asma Syed Khan herself. Asma was doing her doctorate in law, a hugely successful supper club, and best of all, a love for feeding her food and sharing with her guests her story. Asma had probably run about 12 editions of her supper club very successfully, and most of them being booked out months in advance, more often than not oversubscribed. One day she said to me, she was closing Darjeeling Express down because she couldn't carry on doing this at home. It was just far too disruptive. It was clear that Asma dearly loved cooking and feeding people, and I, really mean that. You must go and try Asma's Supper Club once and you'll know what I mean about feeding people. And in Darjeeling Express, she had found the perfect vehicle to do so. She had people who wanted to book months in advance. She had worked so hard to get this far and yet, did she really want to close it down? I asked her what her best days for these supper clubs are and she said, Saturdays and Sunday afternoons work well. It occurred to me that these were the two days when our private dining rooms at the Cinnamon Club had the least demand. And in fact, we weren't even normally open on a Sunday afternoon. So I offered Asma to use the private dining room at the Cinnamon Club for a couple of editions if she wanted. I was absolutely amazed at the combined energy of her guests, her team, 
and how it combines seamlessly with the energy of our teams and our rooms. And in fact, before I say more, I should, I should actually invite Asma Khan to come up and share the rest of her story, please. Asma, thank you. Right, so that, that was a wonderful introduction by Vivek. It was actually a game changer, having this opportunity, because I, I just saw myself as a home cook, because I cooked in my house. And the women who helped me were all housewives, because they, they were the easiest ones. They actually, they can multitask, they were highly skilled. So I had a small team of women who were doing these supper clubs with me. But we never saw ourselves as professional, or actually even called ourselves cooks, because we just felt that we're just doing this at home. You know, it's like feeding family, it's like just, and despite all the kind of enthusiasm, the positive reviews and positive comments by our guests who had paid for these supper club meals, we still felt we were just doing this as if we were just inviting people to our house. So when Vivek suggested this, you know, I was first like completely in awe, quite excited because of a beautiful room. And so for a long time, we went through this kind of excitement of what are we going to cook? And then I realized that no, we're just going to treat this like a supper club, like a normal thing in a very different environment. And it really, it changed everything because I think that walking into a professional kitchen, women who had never been inside a kitchen, suddenly there was that whole feeling that, you know, everybody admitted later on, they just felt very tall. They felt big. They felt like they were something. And, you know, walking and working alongside chefs who were doing exactly the same thing as us because they had their own clients that day, so, you know, in, in the rest of the restaurant. And I think that that was quite an amazing experience, watching, you know, the, the, these chefs, you know, in their chef coats, and all my women were in their shalwar kameez mm. and kurtis, and uh, they just felt really excited. And then at the end of the evening, we all went out. And, you know, the women said, you know, let us all cheer, because we're all, we are cooks. Mm -hmm. Because that was such a big realization, because... Being inside a restaurant and in a kitchen and actually serving alongside chefs who were wonderful to us. I mean, they were really kind of surprised at what we were doing, the way we were dressed and, you know. But they tasted the food and they understood that this is, you know, that they're committed, you know, this is not something that we were just doing to pass our time. And, and actually, it changed my attitude because I had realized now that I actually could take this business somewhere else. And I was offered the opportunity to go to, so to Soho and do a pop-up at a, a pub. And I felt confident, and I thought, I mean, they obviously, I mean, I've, I've done supper clubs, but I've never really run a restaurant, which is what I had to do at Soho. So I walked in there and I told them that I did a pop-up at Cinnamon Club. And that was it, that's all I said, and I got it. <laughs> and I think that that really made a difference because I, I could say that, and I had and done it a couple of times, and it gave me the confidence that we could do it even though it was tough work, because you know, doing a supper club, which is a one-off, running a restaurant is a very different thing. And to be very honest, I wasn't sure, because I, the women who work with me are mainly middle-aged housewives who have never worked before. They've lived in this country for many years. They live in what I would call the Indian ghettos. They live in Wembley and South Hall, and have lived in their own community. Many of them actually are not very confident even using the tube. You know, coming into Soho was quite an excite. I had to go and meet everybody at Alberton, which is just Piccadilly line taking them straight. But I, I just realized that this was something, this was almost like a line they had to cross. Coming into Soho was something really big for them. They always said, we passed it on the bus, but we never got off. And now they were working there. I think really it made a huge difference. And, you know, I, you know we had our hiccups, you know, with you know, women not turning up for work or whatever. Then we had... Everything changed. We had some nice reviews from Esquire, Time Out, and then the very big change, which was we got a great review from Faye Mashler at the Evening Standard. She gave us a four-star review. And the one thing that she mentioned is this is food cooked with love. It is, you know, anyway, I don't know how to put it, but it is food that, you know, your mom would cook. And that is exactly what it was. We were not professional. We cooked with love. There's a lot of passion for cooking in this kitchen. None of us are trained, you know, we have very poor knife skills. You realize that when we had a professional uh, chef coming in, we just thought we'd get him in. In 15 minutes, he had done everything that takes us the whole day to cut. <laughs> and the first thing the women said, oh, no, we can't have him in the kitchen. I said, okay, fair enough, let's get him out. Because, you know, it, it was, uh, because it's not that kind of place. But, you know, we've got there, you know, we turned out the numbers, we fed the people, 
we succeeded. There's, there wasn't a single night when, you know, everyone was exhausted, you know, and it was a struggle. Physically, it was a struggle because that's one issue when you have women who are in their late 40s, 50s, there's some even in their 60s who work for us. But they, they do a full shift. They work extremely hard. And, you know, age is no longer a factor. There's a huge enthusiasm. And having the good reviews and all the pure positive feedback, I think the big thing is that women took ownership of Darjani Express. And that was really, I mean, the night, you know, we had a very good review at the, at the Financial Times. And that was the weekend before Diwali and Lakshmi Puja. For those who don't know, Lakshmi Puja is a, you know, when the Hindu goddess of, of wealth is worshipped. And, and Diwali is something that, you know, you, you light up your entire house, you know, you bring good, you know, good wishes and, and, and good fortune to your own home. These are all women where the core of this celebration is the woman of the house. And I was absolutely sure no one would turn up for work because they'd already told me that the festival's coming up. The review came out. I gave everybody a copy of the FT in turns because I wasn't going to waste £3.50 per person. I said, take it home. Go and show your husband. Go and show your children. You're in the Financial Times. And the day before Lakshmi Puja, everybody turned up. They turned up on Lakshmi Puja. We lit a diya and tried to do some tradition in, in the kitchen because I felt, I realized that they hadn't lit the lamps in their own kitchen, but they came to work. And there was this one grandmother who, you know, leaving grandchildren and her daughters and everyone at home. So I, I thanked her because I realized that she's the most traditional of all our women. And I said, you know, Uma, thank you very much for coming on Lakshmi Puja and Diwali. And her comment, you know, really made me realize that how long, how far these women have come. And this journey has been amazing. because She turned around and told me that, you know, you are my Lakshmi which is the goddess of wealth. She said, this, this kitchen is my temple. Even God would not forgive me if I had not come to work today. <laughs> and, you know, and these are very traditional you know, Indian women who, who are, you know, are first-generation immigrants, who've really not really assimilated in the society, who have held on to their own traditions. And it's amazing. They've come such a long way. On Diwali night, none of us went home till 11 o'clock. And not one person. Of course, we ate huge amounts of sweets. That was our, our excuse that, you know, we, I managed to get lots of laddus. We ate lots of sweets and felt, yeah, yeah, this is Diwali for us. But no one said, I'm missing my family. And no one called home. You know, I kept telling them, you know, you want to take a break? You know, you want to call your kids? They said, no, 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 let's get on. Because we were packed. We were packed. You know, there was a queue. We could see from the kitchen people lining up, waiting outside the pub. for to, And they were like, you know, let's turn tables. Let's get people out. Let's, and it was amazing because, you know, I, I know because I'm Indian. I understand what festivals mean, and especially festivals which are very symbolic for a particular tradition. And anyway, so this is where we are, and so now I'm actually thinking of the next step, opening a restaurant. I have three women now who work part-time for me. They're completely committed. We all talk about our restaurant, and uh, they are going to be my head chef and probably sous chef. And it's been fantastic because, you know, one, we never thought when we started off by doing supper clubs at home that we could do this. But I think the opportunity at Cinnamon changed our view about ourselves. It gave us the confidence because that platform of being in a restaurant like Cinnamon, the, us cooking the food, working alongside chefs, and seeing that, yeah, it's the same thing. You know, they're cooking, we're cooking, we serve the food out plated, and they're happy guests. But that realization was so critical because we, and if we had not had that opportunity to go into a restaurant and cook alongside chefs and have all that praise and the women realizing that they had the skills. Because how much ever I told them that food is great or you know, people praise them, here they saw other people who they saw as professionals because they never saw themselves as a professional. But that changed with Cinema Club. Anyway, so thank you very much for the opportunity. And I will go back and take it back. Thanks, Vivek. Thanks, Asma. Congratulations. I can, I can see a film coming out of all of that. <laughs> like a, a culinary version of Bend It Like Beckham. <laughs> <clears throat> businesses acting as businesses, even those like Roast or the Cinnamon Club, which have an embedded core social perspective, can create permanent social value. But social enterprises can go a lot further. <laughs> A number of them have adopted the conventional commercial restaurant platform and done it not to have a sideline activity with a social impact, but 
to tackle social inequalities as a core uh, motivation of why they've set up in the first place. So we'll now hear from two social enterprises who've done this uh, very cleverly. Firstly, I'd like to invite Jackie Roberts, head of the Shoreditch Trust, which owns and operates the wonderful Waterhouse restaurant. Good evening. Hi, hello. Um, I'm going to talk to you about one of our programmes called Blue Marble Training. Um, Shoreditch Trust uh, is based in the London Borough of Hackney. I don't know if you know it well. Uh, it's quite a large borough. Um, and Blue Marble was set up some time ago, um, specifically where it's with young people 16 to 25, although sometimes we go slightly over that age. Um, and it's part of our strategic aim as a charity, uh, our wider aim to reduce ec economic and social inequality in Hackney. And I'm not going to go into what those issues are in Hackney because you can go away and look those up, but I'm sure people are familiar uh, with some of the, uh, the levels of deprivation that we're looking at in Hackney. Um, we apply a person-centred approach, and that's really important. I'm going to come back to that, but it kind of sort of takes in what people have been talking about this evening so far. Um, we apply this approach uh, to enable vulnerable young people to meet crisis needs, to mitigate risk, enhance skills, knowledge, experience and power. Um, we advocate for greater investment in vulnerable young people. Um, and that's what the programme's really, really about. Um, we're arguing that young people who are supported in the right way to participate can also inspire positive change in industry. And that's really, really important. And I'm going to show you a little film at the end of three chefs who have left our programme and are now employing our trainees. Um, we often talk about working with young people to support them building up resilience. But actually, in the years that I've been working at Shoreditch Trust and with young people on Blue Marble Training, I've met some extraordinary resilience, resilience that I wouldn't have. Um, and actually, re resilience is a, is a difficult thing because we have different levels at which we deal with things. But actually, I've met young people dealing with things that, frankly, are quite extraordinary. Um, and through innovative and dynamic approaches to training, um, and by that, I actually mean way outside the box. I've got a colleague here tonight who knows exactly what I'm talking about. You can imagine that somebody coming into a kitchen, a live kitchen for the very first time, uh, introduced to a team of trainee chefs, uh, our head chef, Amrit, and, and Lorena, our sous chef, um, somebody who might be three days out of a situation that was quite chaotic, potentially violent, um, straight into an environment where they're uh, part of a team, but actually they're also still dealing with some of those emotions and some of those, those issues that they haven't quite left at the door. So when we talk about outside the box, we don't really tick any boxes. We, um, we, don't, we don't have any chances. They're with us for the long haul until we feel and they feel that they're ready to move on. But their contribution is enormous once they do. So that's <coughs> our, our, how we use our dynamic and, and innovative approaches. Young people arrive on our programme with many additional needs, and this is key to the programme. Um, they're facing external challenges with multiple indicators of disadvantage in their lives that continue to hold them back. They're either leaving care or custody. Uh, they're struggling to manage lives with gang-related pressure, poor health. You often think as young people of being at the sort of pinnacle of their health, but actually we see enormous issues around um, very high levels of sugar intake, which causes catastrophic uh, mood swings, um, we see social isolation, we see loneliness. Um, loneliness is seen as, a, as, a, as an older person's issue, particularly in the capital, but actually it's hugely significant with young people. Um, and that not having those networks means that actually it's really difficult to get a foot in anywhere, um, let alone uh, the restaurant industry. Um, they're, they're dealing with those issues plus insecure housing. Again, if you look up um, issues in Hackney, you'll see that we are dealing with exorbitant private rental issues, um, which are basically pricing people out of the borough. And just maintaining a routine and getting to work on time presents enormous difficulties. We have a head chef that Iqbal knows really well. He, he's known to go round to people's houses and get them out of bed and bring them in to training. So we go that far uh, and beyond. Um, the risk of entrenched social exclusion, offending or re-offending is high as a result of these barriers. And Blue Marble Training gives young people a chance to turn things around um, by teaching skills in a real kitchen 
with a real team uh, attached to a real restaurant, leading to real opportunities and making real changes to lives. The programme also focuses on the development of those skills that are often overlooked. So it's not just about knife skills, which are really important, as we've discovered, um, and also speed, which is hugely important, as um, we've also discovered. But also those things that are, are some of us really do take for granted. So thinking creatively, emotional development, uh, being able to collaborate, uh, thinking about innovation in a very different way. Bearing in mind a lot of these young people have come through systems where they've been excluded consistently throughout their lives. So we try and support them to develop these, um, these skills, not even skills, I suppose, but just these opportunities to be able to really find out who they are while they're with us. Um, and leadership. Once they put on their blue marble T-shirts and aprons, they are trainee chefs. They are no longer uh, a gang member. They're no longer that kid that was excluded and has been warned three times by the local copper. They are trainee chefs, and that's really important. Um, we commissioned a social return on investment report uh, independently, and it concluded that Blue Marble Training demonstrates a successful model of work-based training, and that's really important. I'm going to come to some of the issues around having lots and lots of young people in a live restaurant setting. Um, and Shoreditch Trust and Blue Marble Training are meeting the aims and objectives and outcomes expected of it by its stakeholders and funders. We're working closely with ex-offender and care leavers uh, and creating many outcomes, including those that are not being invested in. And this is my frustration with running the programme um, and something I've talked to Iqbal at, at length about. Um, we probably need to be better at demonstrating those facts and figures around reoffending rates, of which we have none on our programme. Um, but actually, it's really hard to tell that story when you're dealing with real lives and you're talking about people who are in the room. Um, so the report confirms that we have reduced truancy, increased engagement in education and training, very often for the first time for some young people, reduction in youth offending, sustained continued transitions from care to independent living. Um, Iqbal talked about somebody leaving prison with £43. Very often a young person will move into their own flat and not know how to pay the gas bill, not realise you have to pay for water, uh, not know where to buy a bed. So we do all of that with them as well. Uh, it's an alternative to gang culture in Hackney um, and it's an alternative to violence and crime in the borough. Uh, increased peer-to-peer -peer mentoring communities with an endemic underemployment and that's also about our trainees who've grown up in the area and move on to some of London's top restaurants and come back to us to recruit uh, the next generation of chefs in their own kitchens and for me that's a really significant part of the story. Um, there are consequences of handing trust and responsibility to people who may not have yet been granted this in their lives and are still coming to terms with what that means. We are on probably the fourth blender this year. Um, we've reduced our food waste, but really when someone is in the kitchen for the first time and they're asked to make mashed potato and they mash the potatoes while they're still raw, you have to buy new ingredients. So we do see a lot of waste and that does cost us. But actually, we accept that running a training programme in a live restaurant setting can come at a cost. But we believe that it's the only way to ensure that trainees can really progress and take ownership of their future. There is something quite significant about being in a kitchen, an open kitchen, where customers can see you, uh, where they can see their food being prepared, where you can see customers enjoying their food. Um, it is really sig a significant part of the programme. We meet these challenges in many, many different ways, um, and this is where it is very costly to run a programme like ours and frustrating because it's trying to demonstrate that, that spending the money here is really, really significant further down the road. As we know, it's complete common sense, but you'd be amazed how many times I have to demonstrate this to people who hold the purse strings. Um, it provides self-leadership coaching, which is really key, and we've, we've only just been doing that for the last year, but we've seen a significant improvement in just very basic things like self-esteem, being able to really focus on goals and focus on training in the kitchen. Physical fitness, we do a huge amount of that now because we realised that the sugar intake was significant and we're not about to take on the sugar industry and the soft <coughs> drinks industry so we're going to try and tackle it from our own kitchen which is actually cutting out the leucosade and trying to promote water um, but at the same time running around the park which has a huge impact on everything um, including energy but also mental health 
um, one-to-one counselling as part of our own uh, mental health programme. We have a mental health programme in our charity as well. And we deliver healthy eating sessions, which my colleague here does, um, through the Food for Life programme at Shoreditch Trust as well. So lots and lots of different aspects to the training to really sort of provide that, um, that basis so that young people can go in and, and really take part and participate in the training. So these support activities provide a space for trainees to reflect. Really important, we take that for granted. I do it every day. A lot of young people through the education system don't understand that reflection is a big part of developing who you are uh, and forming those networks and friendships. Um, it helps them to understand and navigate the training and the work environment to contribute to their own outcomes instead of the outcomes that have been enforced on them while they've been growing up. Um, to understand good <coughs> practice and how to challenge themselves in a constructive way uh, instead of fighting and throwing things on the floor and walking out of the kitchen, we have a very different technique to that. And to make the connection between well-being and work satisfaction hugely important, that actually if I feel good, I'm more likely to want to get up for work in the morning and go and really achieve something that day. Key to the programme is peer mentoring. Um, the presence of role models uh, who themselves are graduates of the training programme is very important and help trainees to develop a sense of responsibility and can obviously see the longer road ahead and the bigger picture. Our advanced trainees support the new participants on the programme who are terrified on their first day in that kitchen and they're encouraged to inspire, train and mentor themselves as they move on. And we continue to mentor our alumni once they've left us. Um, and you're about to meet Jack, Leanne and Luca. Jack left us pretty much three years ago, but we're still mentoring Jack. So I suppose the other point about this industry is that um, it provides an opportunity uh, for young people to really learn some hard skills that are actually very transferable as well. Um, but also there's a network in the kitchen, there's a family in the kitchen, um, there's a sense of belonging in the kitchen as as part of a team and this is really really important in, in supporting some of the young people we work with to recover from what they've been through while they've been growing up so here's a little film thank you my attitude was just rubbish it was completely rubbish i was so anti-social it was unbelievable i was getting in so much trouble um, with the police and involved in gangs and that that i didn't really have any options at the time I didn't do well in, in school, I went to college, didn't do well in college. I uh, kept, kept finding the same repetitive thing happening. I didn't want to feel like I was just doing nothing. Fighting was my solution to everything. I wasn't good with words, I couldn't express myself without being angry. I went into my care home, my placement at three years old, and I stayed there until 14. So then you just sort of grow up thinking that you're owed for some reason. You don't have to come with actually any sort of knowledge. You don't have to know how to chop. You don't have to know what goes well together. You, you go there, you learn, and you teach. Everybody's there to help each other. It's, it's like a system. Personally, for me, it wasn't the work that I was going to find hard. It was the interaction with people that you wouldn't you wouldn't have known or you wouldn't have spent time with, so it's like basically going to a new school. You have to have a very loud, stern voice in the kitchen, like you can't just be in the background. You've got to build that um, confidence. Completely changed my life. It makes you feel like home after, it makes you feel like you're in a family. Just the bond that you have within Shoreditch Trust and Blue Marble. I've learned, I think all the life skills, that I, all the important life skills that I'm going to need in order to pursue my goals. If you feel like something's new to you and you're afraid, don't worry, you know, you'll be welcomed and everybody I'm sure will show you the right direction within the kitchen. Knowing that you, you're needed somewhere, it's the most priceless feeling that nothing could ever give you.
Thanks, Jackie. <clears throat> when you look at our inner city high streets, we see many manifestations of urban blight. And through them, we've witnessed many ironic successes, like the pound shop. Uh, the most worrying high street success, though, is the rise of the fast food joint. Um, the popularity of these joints is lar largely driven by price, so the provenance of the chickens um, must be deeply worrying. This has a clear trajectory of direction for our youngsters. These fast food, fast buck operators clog up our high streets. Youngsters clog up their queues. These youngsters' arteries, in due course, get clogged up. And then the obesity and heart disease wards get clogged up by ever more patients. The social cost of these seemingly innocuous food uh, has yet to be properly uh, calculated by health officials because of the consequences are too scary of doing that. Um, moaning about this trend is all well and good, but what can restaurants do about it? Last month in Tottenham, a great new project opened up uh, challenging the way in which youngsters eat fried chicken and looking at ways in which they can live longer and healthier lives. So what is this great new alternative to the chicken shop? Well, it's a chicken shop, um, but it's a chicken shop with a difference. Um, it was created by Hadrian Gerard, who will now tell us about how Chicken Home came about. <coughs> Thank you, Iqbal. Um, I think as I talk, there'll be pictures of fried chicken, <laughs> sort of in an ambient way. So I hope you're not too hungry. Um, it's fried chicken that we've cooked. So I, I, it's, it's nice to stand here with an open restaurant, because I came to see Iqbal about four and a half years ago. And so oh, we want to do... We, it was me and a guy called Ben Reimer who's running the restaurant. He's there tonight um, in an apron. Um, it was when burgers started being done in a good way. It was when Byron started opening up an honest burger and people were looking at, at fast food in a slightly different way. And we, we really like fried chicken. So we were like, well, let's just open a, a, a posh fried chicken shop because we love fried chicken. Let's just do it better. Um, so four and a half years later, quite a lot of things happen. W one of which is there are some posh fried chicken places. There's uh, the Wishbone, which has changed hands in Brixton. There's um, Mother Clucker. There's, people have done fried chicken and it's it's... But it costs about um, 14 or 15 pounds for two pieces of chicken and chips and a side. And if you're, if you're a 14-year-old living in, in, in London, in Hackney, are you going to spend 14 pounds or are you going to spend 1.99 on six wings, chips and a drink? Well, of course, you're going to go and spend 1.99. So we, we spent a lot of time meeting young people and talking about fried chicken shops and, and looking at them quite seriously. Um, f fried chicken is delicious. It's really, it's really nice. Um, it's even nicer if you're a bit drunk on the way home. Um, and then you feel a bit ill afterwards. Um, it's really bad for you if you eat it two or three times a day, which is what a lot of young people that we met and we, we commissioned a study to look at this um, in Birmingham and in London. It's an organisation called Shift, who are a behavioural change organisation. They met lots and lots of young people. Um, there are things that fried chicken shops are good at. Um, they offer really fast food. You can get your lunch in like 15 minutes and you're in and out. If you're a young person, you don't get hassled. After If you can spend two pounds, then you can spend an hour in a fried chicken shop and no one's going to give you grief. And like, in, if you're in McDonald's for more than half an hour and you're a young person, you start to get edged out of the door. Um, you're full up. You spend £2.50 and you're full up. So if you're a mum, you're a you mum, you've got two small children, you've got £4 in your pocket, you can take them to a chicken shop and, and your kids won't be hungry afterwards. Um, and they offer a kind of environment which young people feel comfortable in. They, they, they can spend a bit of time in there. They can meet their friends there. So, yes, the food is really bad. It's really bad. It's the worst chicken in the world. You couldn't invent worse food. It's, it's battery caged hens, largely from South America a lot of the time, flown, flown here, stored for a, a long time, and then, and then cooked in quite old oil that's been there for a few days um, for about 15 or 16 minutes. Um, it's full of fat, it's full of hormones and unknown stuff. The salt levels are kind of astronomical, this MSG. The chips are really bad, they're over-salted, they're cooked in the same oil, and you get a big fizzy drink thrown in as well. So it's pretty much the worst food you could eat. Um, 
And from a social justice perspective, we, we were kind of in East London. I run a charity that's based in East London, like Jackie, and we're interested in ideas of fairness. And what we're seeing in East London is people eat amazingly. So you can eat so well in London and like never before. Um, there are restaurants opening every other week. Um, people are really into food. They're really into street food. But if you're a teenager and you're not from a wealthy family and you're living in East London, you've probably got one of the worst diets in Western Europe. And in Tottenham, where our restaurant's based, 41% of 11-year-olds are obese. So that's clinically obese, and the national average is something like 21%. So it's pretty much double the national average. So, so the idea is quite simple. We, we cook really delicious fried chicken. We've worked with... Um, a number of really interesting chefs who have designed some recipes that are so our chicken is free range chicken from Yorkshire um, we brine it overnight and then we steam it um, so it's pretty much cooked and then we flash fry it to order um, in cold pressed rapeseed oil in a really good fryer for about two minutes two and a half minutes so it contains one seventh of the salt content of your typical piece of fried chicken. It's good chicken to start with, so it tastes delicious. Um, it has a third of the fat content, and we serve it with a mixture of sides. Um, we really like chips, so the idea of not giving young people chips is kind of problematic. So again, we looked at chips, and, and there are ways of cooking chips that are much less bad for you. So if you leave the skin on, if you cut them quite thick, if you steam them in the same process as the chicken, then fry them for a much shorter length of time, then or at your salt fat content is much better and there's actually some fiber in it as well. Um, the KFC menu's got vegetables in it. So you can get coleslaw, you can get baked beans, you can get corn. So there's a familiar, there's a kind of vernacular of fried chicken that contains vegetables, right? So we, we, we're now serving vegetables to kids. Um, and they're seasonal, and um, that's, a, that's a good thing as well. So basically, the, the model, the business model, has taken as, almost as much time as the recipe. So basically, it's a, it, it, it's a way of subsidizing lunch and after-school meals. So basically, in the evening, it's full price, and people like us can go, and you can come and have delicious fried chicken, different varieties, and it's really nice, really well cooked, good service. You can get beer, you can get a glass of wine, and you'll spend per head about 14 or 15 pounds. But you know that all of the money that you spend is being used to subsidize kids in the daytime to come in and get it for two pounds. So the two pounds price point is what you'd spend at Chicken Cottage or Dixie Chicken. Um, and kids can come in between 12 o'clock and 5.30. We close at 5.30 and the staff have lunch, kids leave, we turn the lights down, and we're a bit more fancy. Um, <laughs> so it's a really simple model. It's a way of basically you can go and eat out in your community and have um, the food. Did you see the food? Was it on there? <laughs> yeah, yeah all, all that stuff. Um, and you know that your money is being, being used to get kids in in the daytime and start a conversation about food. So there's a really big obesity epidemic, and this isn't the solution, but it's part of a solution. I think giving young people choice, um, uh, making an, an environment welcoming um, and actually giving them a quality of service that, that gives them respect and giving, gives them food that gives them respect is, I think, really, really important for, for young people in the city. So we're now open and you can come and visit us whenever you like. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. All around London, we see empty retail spaces. And these so easily with little imagination and creative flair could be used for better purposes. And aspirant restaurateurs, who often lack access to finance, um, are increasingly able to use them. And I recently came across an organisation called Grub Club, which takes supper clubs and transports them into these empty retail units. Um, the creator of uh, Grub Club is Olivia Sibony. So, Olivia, please tell us how... Uh, how it worked for you in Catford. Thanks, Iqbal. Uh, so, yeah, I'm uh, Olivia Sibony. I'm the co-founder of Grub Club. Um, sorry, how do... Yes, the slides are there. Amazing. Um, so, just to give you an overview of what is um, Grub Club. So, actually, I'm going to... Thanks. Um, 
now, amazingly, by coincidence, I use this slide a lot. That is an ex chef from uh, Cinnamon Club, just to bring it all back in. Uh, total coincidence, but great. Um, so we are a platform for dining experiences, supper clubs, pop-up restaurants. So how does it work? You have talented chefs from great backgrounds who are looking to set up their own business, um, and they are looking for spaces to host in. Um, so we connect them with venues. Now, there are tons of venues around the city which um, go underused at specific times. So there are cafes that close in the evenings um, that struggle to compete against the like of Starbucks, for example, and yet have that empty space in the evening. Um, there are museums that are closed at the weekends, um, you know, restaurants that have a quiet night, um, a bit like Vivek was explaining earlier. Um, so we'll connect these uh, chefs, fledg fledgling chefs, with these underused spaces to enable them to host their restaurant for the night. They then showcase those dinners on our platform um, and uh, diners who are a little bit bored of the sort of, uh, you know, Pizza Express offering come to our platform, discover these dinners, book through our platform and attend. Um, so this enables the chefs on the one hand to uh, build a profile, um, build a following, and it's really providing the stepping stones to help them towards their journey of opening up a restaurant um, and lowering the barrier to entry uh, to achieve that goal without having to have, you know, a huge amount of um, financing behind them and, and all of the risk involved because they do it um, step by step. Obviously, for the venues, it's an extra source of income. So when they're closed anyway in the evenings, uh, this is a way for them to get a bit of extra money. But it's also nice exposure for them. So, you know, people might go into Starbucks because that's just that's what they know. And that's part of their pattern. But actually, if you take them outside of that uh, environment and you bring them into a different cafe, um, to eat in the evening, they might then return during the daytime to actually buy their coffee there. So it's um, supporting those businesses along the way. Um, and for diners, um, not only is it a sort of fun dinner, but it's actually a really interesting way to um, support chefs in their journey and actually meet other like-minded people. So all of the dinners are social dinners. Um, so as you were saying earlier, in terms of sort of social exclusion, this kind of enables them to connect with other people around a dinner. And um, so that's how we work uh, broadly. Um, so how does that uh, impact specific communities? Um, so really the idea is to bring people together. Um, so we were contacted by London Borough of Lewisham and um, they actually earmarked um, Catford as an area which um, is in need of regeneration. Um, so what they did is um, they contacted us and, and we worked together with them to help, on the one hand, support local businesses and local traders, and on the other hand, re-engage um, local communities. So um, from a diner perspective, the objectives were really to improve social cohesion. So Catford is a very uh, diverse area which lacks a lot of social cohesion. So it's not necessarily hugely deprived from an economic uh, sense, but it's it doesn't really have anything for anyone to do at any time. So as a result, you know, no one sort of felt engaged with the community. There was quite a high crime rate. Uh, people, you know, there were the local businesses were struggling because there was nothing uh, to bring the uh, residents out to do. Um, so the the aim of the project uh, in doing a, um, a six month pop up uh, in Catford was to bring about uh, social cohesion, uh, capital on this capitalize on the strength and diversity of the local community, uh, raise the lo raise the profile of the local area. So they wanted to bring a. Um, people outside, from outside of Catford into Catford and actually make them discover an area that they may not have been to before. Um, they also wanted to promote, promote the nighttime activity. So in this particular case, they, um, uh, uh, we took over a shop that was um, a closed shop inside a sort of an alien, alien, 
ailing, sorry, I tried to find the word, an ailing shopping center. Um, and, and there was a huge amount of crime in that shopping center in the evenings because it had, it was sort of a 1960s sort of old um, concrete block which had all these different alleyways and corridors and it was quite easy for people to sort of hide and attack people. So actually by bringing this shopping center to life in the evening, it actually brought a lot of activity and reduced um, the crime rate um, around there. Um, and they wanted to attract a new kind of demographic to the um, town centre and promote uh, intergenerational uh, connections by bringing people together. Um, for the food entrepreneurs, the aim was to really give opportunities to new businesses to be able to start up uh, on their food journeys, but also give a platform for uh, new uh, fledgling uh, food businesses to actually grow their their base to a, a larger public. Um, so they were really supporting the local businesses and they were really capitalizing on this growing trend of pop-ups um, to sort of bring about a new image in the area. Um, so this was the beautiful space we were given. Um, and uh, so we sort of worked with, uh, you know, a, a local experienced chef actually and uh, uh, providers to turn it into this three days later. Um, so this is the space that actually um, came to life um, for, this, for this period. Um, and um, over the space of six months, we had a whole rotation of different chefs in there. If you go to the next one, thanks. Um, so as an example, we had Inner Pickle. Um, so they were, they just started off uh, doing, uh, actually Mark, um, who's there, had recently lost his job. Um, uh, it was a sort of, you know, nine to five office job. And uh, he was trying to sort of make ends meet by working in market stalls. So he discovered Catford Canteen. He was local to Catford. Um, and so he started doing these um, dinners through Grub Club at um, Catford. And actually, um, what it enabled him to do is really um, bring his concept. So he does, so he's from Barbados, so he cooks Bayesian cuisine. And he wanted to show London that um, there's a different style of Caribbean cuisine that um, people should try out. So, so through this, he started doing an increasing number of pop-ups. And actually, this is um, just under two years ago. And since then, he's, um, this is now his permanent employment. He's done a huge number of uh uh, public supper clubs but what's happened as a result is a lot of people have contracted him to do private events as well so a lot of companies uh, bring him you know he's been overwhelmed with doing Christmas parties um, we were doing a filming shoot last week he came to do uh, the cooking for our filming shoot and actually it's just brought about a huge amount of opportunities they started as a team of two they're now a team of six so they've also uh, created new employment and um, for each dinner through sort of practice by, um, they've managed to increase their revenue by 50% for every event that they did. Um, and that is through a mix of increasing the number of guests as they went, um, having better cost efficiencies and also increasing the price of the dinners as they went because they um, got increasingly good reviews. Um, so they're, you know, one of the examples of the um, people who got an opportunity through this project. Um, so just to summarize some of the impact that the project had. So um, as a result of this, seven um, businesses started up, seven food, food startups. Um, they had 55 press mentions, which actually made a really big difference to Catford as an area itself. Um, over 800 guests, 29 events. Uh, they were featured on uh, BBC News. And actually what was interesting is what happens beyond the food. So not only did, you know, these chefs get opportunities and diners have a good time, but it really did create a really great social impact for the cohesion of the local community. And um, they create, the diners who met at the dinner um, created Catford Society, um, which is sort of creates a lot of different events, including the Catford Film Club. Um, they went on to create a new series, which called Deptford uh, Brunch Club. Um, and that had a little pause and actually they've just come back to launch a new series and excitingly this new series is done with absolutely no funding from the council so um the council really saw a great uh impact we know with their initial investment because it's now got this longevity and doesn't actually need any more financial support from them so yeah that's just one of the examples <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks, Livia. Rob Cobb's goals are very ambitious, so she didn't mention, but um, their aim is to be the Uber of supper clubs. <laughs> um, business people often ask me uh, when will this restaurant, London restaurant scene, that's continually exploding, um, uh, stop? When will it slow down? Every single part of central London real estate seems to become a restaurant these days, and um, men, it typically is men, pay uh, eye-watering sums to open places in London. And um, so if you ask a question, how democratic and easy and accessible is the process of starting a restaurant, until recently the answer would be not very much. And entrepreneurs emerge out of all, all kinds of social conditions. And enabling entrepreneurship has become an enterprise in itself. Curb has set a path for dozens of individual street food heroes and heroines, and in some cases, restaurateurs too. Um, underpinning our restaurant revolution, there's been a separate and parallel street food revolution where people are bypassing our fancy restaurants and going into new areas um, where there's cutting edge, more authentic food offerings in completely new environments at completely different price points from ours. The promoters of the street food project Street Feast have recently launched a multi-million pound uh, campaign to launch something called London Union. They launched about a week ago uh, with the name of opening with 3.5 million pounds. I believe as of last night, they're at two and a half million. Um, so th this is becoming big business in itself now. But the advent of street food has really um, been uh, the brainchild of Petra Barron, the, uh, the founder of uh, Curb. She understandably hates the title that the press have given her, which is the queen of street food, but undoubtedly she is. Petra, why don't you come and tell us how this has all happened? Hi. <coughs> Thank you, Iqbal. Um, first of all, I want to say that Curb is one of a few factors that has triggered this this. Um, generation of entrepreneurs um, hitting the streets and selling their food. Um, for, I mean, who would, who would have thought that you'd be doing this um, 10 years ago, standing out in the cold, hanging onto your gazebo, hoping that it won't fly away, trying to shove some burgers around a grill and hope that people are gonna come, it wouldn't have happened. So things have really come a long way. Um, but there are key ideals that have informed our approach which has resonated with wider cultural shifts and people making changes in their careers as they seek greater meaning in their work. Um, so what is Curb? Curb is a membership organisation of over 60 of London's greatest street food traders. Uh, we organise lunch markets across the city as well as traders for private events from weddings to conferences to um, office parties and all sorts of things as catering is changing as well as the food that's being served on the streets. Um, here is a film to tell you a little bit more about Curb before I continue. <clears throat> this is a really exciting time for London's food culture. This is a really exciting time for London's food culture. Food cooked and served on the streets enables any and anyone to participate in it. We called it Curb because that's where it all starts, out there on that strip of concrete, cooking, feeding London something special, enlivening the spaces of the city. It's entrepreneurs taking their first steps into the food business. It's the reason that cities began in the first place, through the trading of food in public spaces. It's the launch pad for fledgling food businesses to get their ideas out there and start testing the market. It's a platform and a stage, and where everyone, no matter where you're from or for how long you're here, is part of something really good. And it's where this brilliant community of doers and street cooks gets their kicks earns their stripes and brings fun and flavour to these grey old London streets, day in, day out, whatever the weather. It's not for the faint-hearted though, it's hard work and every day is a gamble. But for those that love it, you can't mess with it. You're out there on the curb, playing a role in the city, in this big old city. You've got something to do, something to contribute, feeding people, in charge of your own product, 
making London taste better. Our traders come from all over the place and bring with them the stories and recipes that make their businesses unique. They're obsessed with what they cook and what they do and we are obsessed with clustering it all. Curb brings it all together, creating spaces for this culture to grow, to multiply, to collaborate and to improve. The films in this series start to tell the story of people and food and cooking, eating and working together in public. Hope you're feeling hungry. Tuck in. Okay, that's it. Thanks very much. No, sorry, I'm joking. I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, yeah, so how did Curve start? Um, so it's 2005 and um, I decided that I wanted to start a chocolate van and drive it around the country and sell brownies and hot chocolate and sundaes and truffles and chocolate martini shots under the counter and um, milkshakes and all sorts of things. And back then it was considered to be, um, there was no such thing as a street food hero. People didn't even talk about street food. It was just, you're, you're a mobiler. It was like really sort of old school. You're, you're a dodgy ice cream van driver. Um, and it was like a quirky lifestyle choice where people would be wondering when you were gonna get a proper job. Um, so when I was on the road, I, you know, I, I would go to festivals and markets and fates and weddings and anywhere that people were hungry. And um, while I was at all of these events, I'd meet all, all of these other traders and inevitably I would not have a drill for something that needed drilling or pens or change or whatever. And everyone was always more than happy to help you. It was incredible. I couldn't believe how sort of open and, and natural this community was with, amongst all these transient, um, different, like disparate traders. And it really, um, it really inspired me. It was a whole kind of side effect of me just wanting to sell chocolate and be on the road. It was actually all of these different people who were already doing that kind of thing for their own reasons. And I um, felt like there was something in the air. So um, one day I had this kind of vision that we should all get together, get organized um, and create more of what we've got. And um, something that was less serendipitous, less kind of like, oh, we've just bumped into each other at a festival and more organized. Um, so from that moment, Eat Street was born, um, which was a street food collective, the first in the country. Um, our strapline was driving British street food forward. Um, I scoured every event I went to, I'd like drive, park up at events and kind of ditch my van and kind of go and see who was doing what and what they were cooking and everything and I'd collar them and see if I could sign them up to this kind of fledgling collective which wasn't really anything it was just me trying to gather together traders who were doing good stuff um, and slowly Eat Street became something that had momentum we got our first market from King's Cross, the redevelopment that was happening. Um, it started in 2011 when King's Cross was, I was talking to Jackie earlier about King's Cross a few years ago, and there just really wasn't much going on there. And they wanted to create a new narrative for King's Cross that was beyond uh, the red lights and the drugs and everything like that. And they wanted to do it with food. And they realized that by putting um, a collective like Eat Street there, that it would attract a different kind of person and it would attract, um, it would create a new story for the space. Um, so from Eat Street came Curb. Um, and it's really been about finding passionate street cooks um, and helping to create a scene that was all or helping to create a scene that was just going to develop and grow across London. And slowly more and more people started hearing about it. And it was customers go, getting excited that they could have something different other than prep. And it was um, people going, oh my God, that's actually a thing. You can become a trader. You can make, maybe make a living from it. And it started to kind of snowball a lot from there. Um, so now we are three years old and we have... Um, had markets operating in King's Cross, obviously, Paddington, Maida Hill, Peckham, South Bank, King's Cro um, Hackney Wick, Spitalfields, all over the place. And everywhere we go, it's always kind of slightly different customers, but everyone's pretty much the same in the, the love of food and, and the kind of joy of being around all these people that love cooking what they're cooking. So um, it's a lot of fun. Um, so from the position of food lover, food trader and then market organiser to business owner with a lusty interest in urbanism. There have been some key objectives I've identified and around which Curb has developed and continues to hold true. So one of them is that clustering is key. 
Um, it creates strength in numbers, greater visibility, sharing of information. That's like a really vital part of what Curb's about. It's like this incredible resource um, where you've got all these different traders and that they together know everything about street trading. And that's a really powerful thing to tap into. And they constantly help one another and help us. And um, it's, uh, it's self-perpetuating. Um, it creates more opportunities and clustering creates alternative communities. Um, I think that this is probably the number one reason that uh, traders want to sign up to Curb is because of the community that it gives them. Being a trader um, by its nature is a really individualist kind of process and it's really uh, hard work and you're out there in the British elements, um, you know, like it's tough, it's lonesome. Um, so you've got this kind of group of engaged other people doing what you're doing and it feels uh, reassuring to have that and it's it's um, it definitely helps um, another thing is that food transforms space um, love of food is one of the only universal human truths we live in cities that are full of change and cultures we don't always understand when you put food in public on shared space at street level boundaries are dissolved and co-production is created Everyone is bonded for those few moments in a space of common experience that can make you feel part of a city like very few other things can. Um, the other thing is British food needs to improve, and I know it has improved loads in the last 10 years, but part of the thing that's always driven me and drives a lot of the people that we work with is that Britain's always had such a terrible reputation for food, and it's embarrassing when you go to other countries and they're kind of <clears throat> telling you, how awful it must be to be British and the food that you must have to eat and have bland and everything and it's just really annoying and um, I really think that by putting the best together everyone runs a better race and um, you know like when we bring in a new buck who's kind of like some kid that we've just discovered that's just full of you know cojones and really kind of ready to ready to rumble on the streets and and a lot of the traders will be like oh my god quick kind of can't let the side down gotta raise our game as well and I really believe that the more the more you do that the more you create market forces um within the market the better the market is I think Britain's been a uh, victim to a lot of antiquated uh, laws in terms of our markets where there is no competition there's no role for competition you've got your pitch and you've got it for life and your family inherit your pitch and it just doesn't create a very kind of exciting or dynamic um, scene so that's one of the things that is really exciting about putting street food traders together um, as we've grown in numbers and visibility, awareness of selling food on the streets as a career choice has also grown. It's been extraordinary to watch the perception of it change in the last 10 years. Um, bankers and lawyers and ad executives deciding that their jobs aren't as fulfilling or as gratifying as they would have hoped. Um, carving out a new career path which sees them ditching their suits and kind of putting on their pinnies and learning how to pitch a gazebo and roll out a flooring. Um, whilst I'd like to take credit for triggering this movement, I believe it's come along at a time when we are also entering a new age. Uh, Roman Kritznarik of the School of Life says, we've entered a new age of fulfillment in which the great dream is to trade up from money to meaning. And we see this everywhere we go. We see this uh, in the traders that we work with who have ditched their jobs to the customers that come along that perhaps don't want to eat a laminated sandwich, want to look in the eyes of the person that's selling them their food and know where that food comes from and um, shorten the connection between the person and the producer. Um, and a food business that is set up and run by you and you alone presents the most amazing, albeit incredibly challenging, route to fulfilment. I think for feeling like an individual in charge of your own thing and with a valuable role to play in the city, as well as creator of change in the London food scene, <clears throat> and a member of an exciting and engaged trader community, it is addictive. However, it's still got a long way to go. There's many, many uh, hurdles that we've got across um, around space and uh, weather. I don't know if we're ever going to cross that, that hurdle. Um, this generation of food entrepreneurs are growing up and the whole thing is changing. Curb's next move is to ensure that we adapt as it changes. Um, whilst retaining our core values of trader community plus street life plus great food. Um, next year's goals are to join our two pillars of markets and private events with our incubator arm, which is something that we've been doing kind of 
uh, a lot of, but we need to really kind of grow it. And that's really where I think Curb can make, guarantee its longevity in London. So it's not just a trend, it transcends the fact that it's trendy and it continues to inspire new generations of people wanting to start their food businesses and also makes it a more accessible um, industry beyond the bankers and the ad execs leaving their jobs. So that's our next challenge. Um, but we've established a foundation and a great community of traders who would all really like to get involved in that as well. So uh, wish us luck and come to our markets when you can. Thanks very much. <clears throat> <clears throat> Thanks, Petra. I began this talk by saying that restaurants can act as agents for social renewal. We've seen how Vivek enabled Asma to become a restaurateur. We've seen how Waterhouse and Chickentown have used the dining environment in which to correct social failures. And we've heard from Olivia and Petra about the new economy that has emerged to challenge the convention of restaurant startups. Let me tell you one final story before concluding. This is Mohamed Munim. I first met Mo um, when he'd just barely been out of his teens and had seen the insides of far too many prisons for good kids who just happened to have uh, fallen um, on the wrong side of the track. In his time in prison, he'd uh, grown for an interest in food uh, while working in a kitchen. And he was fearful that on his return out, his old East London gang would grab him and nab him and he'd be back inside again before too long. Um, so I gave him a job as a food runner at Roast. And um, he did very well, and uh, soon became a waiter. And then, um, and one day he said, he told me he was leaving. He was going to work in a cafe. And I said, why did you leave Roast to go and work in a cafe? And he said, well, they've made me the manager of the cafe. Um, he did so well with it, he opened a second, and then a third, and then this morning, he just contacted me to say that he'd be given his fourth cafe to run, and he's employing ex-offenders at each and every one of them. And that's what restaurants can do and, and, and achieve beyond our traditional purpose. We drive social change, as evidenced many times over this evening. We educate, encourage, and empower those who haven't had the lucky breaks that many of us have had in life. We can measure and communicate those impacts to others. And we can now put a resource behind these activities, because as with the case of Andrew from Brixton Prison, we can see um, the ultimate sustainable commercial crowd pleaser. Mm -hmm. And that's that doing good is good for business. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to everyone on the panel and to, to Iqbal as well for putting the panel together. I think we've seen tonight a lot of, of very powerful stories that make us uh, uh, reflect on the way in which food can change lives, can change communities, um, and indeed inspire us uh, uh, to, do, uh, to do these things and to use food to these ends. Um, rather than taking questions from the audience, what I'd like to do is invite everyone to join us for a reception uh, in the area just outside of the lecture uh, theater, uh, where all of the speakers will be available, and uh, you can come and ask them uh, questions individually, okay? Thank you very much, everyone, for attending, uh, and we wish you a good, good evening.